Hello out there in YouTube land. My name is Kevin, and I've been smoking a pipe since the 1980s. And I've seen many changes in the pipe smoking world. And in this series, I would like to share some of my experiences and maybe answer some questions you may have wondered about, or even some that you might never that might never have occurred to you. So please uh, sit back, and if you haven't already, light up your pipe. One thing I've noticed uh, in the many YouTube pipe tobacco reviews I've seen is people commenting about the brevity of tin descriptions on older blends. And Bradley Stuffins things, uh, you've often made such comments when reviewing uh, tins of Dunhill and so have many others. Uh, but you are in many ways the uh, inspiration for this particular video and maybe even the rest of the series. So take this tin of Nightcap. Don't know if you can see it, but the tin description reads, A rich flavored smoking mixture for the evening with its periods of relaxation and leisure. Now, by contrast, let's take this tin from a, a more contemporary and a truly great blender, uh, GLPs. Uh, I've chosen Black Point from my shelf, not based on the tin description, uh, but simply because of the blend's similarity to Nightcap. Black Point is a luxurious blend of red and lemon Virginia leaf, Cyprian Latakia, exotic oriental tobaccos, and a gentle measure of Louisiana Perique for a lovely piquant finish. Now, no doubt you will see a major difference between the two. The latter lists uh, the constituent tobaccos while still using adjectives like luxurious, gentle, piquant. While the former tells us nothing about what tobaccos were used, though it, it does use uh, words like rich flavored and tells us about the time of day for which it was intended, although the name and the art probably tell us that much already. Another one is unique. Uh, other Dunhills uh, are just as brief. Gawith Tobacco offers nothing beyond the name, usually, while GLP and C&D uh, are similarly you know, loquacious in a good way. Durbar, blended for the more experienced and mature pipe tobacco smoker. Early morning pipe, a mellow, delicately flavored smoking mixture. Baby's bottom, or whatever it's called in, in near the cow, offers nothing at all. Now, some Dunhill blends do kind of buck the trend a bit in content, if not in, in length. London mixture, medium cut matured Virginian and Oriental tobacco's soft and mellow flavor. I, I won't go through examples of the modern variety because I think they've become such a norm that uh, it would be unthinkable for a modern blender to not use words like Virginia and Burley and Orientals, etc. You know, and if you were in a, a physical tobacco shop looking at tins you've never had before, you would know without even trying them whether a given blend was a Virginia or a Vapor or a Balkan, etc. But why? What has changed? And I don't think any one answer is going to completely answer that to everybody's satisfaction, but I think maybe I can shed some light on the issue. Basically, the average pipe smoker today is a hell of a lot more informed than the average pipe smoker was decades ago. And I, and I stress that I'm talking about the average pipe smoker, not all of them, because this distinction is especially important when talking about the past. But there's a common belief that pipe smoking was bigger in the past. And that's not wrong, but it might be misinterpreted. So you're a pipe smoker, I assume. Do you consider pipe smoking to be a hobby? And I dare say most of you are gonna say yes. I mean, the fact that you've bothered to watch a YouTube video about this question pretty much guarantees it. But this brings me to the one major difference between now and then, uh, that I think newer smokers might not fully appreciate. Pipe smoking is a hobby. Few people, at least in the community, would deny that. But today's pipe smoker is almost by definition a hobbyist. And that wasn't always the case. All right, so when I started smoking a pipe, it quickly became a hobby, and many of you will have the same story. I'm going to go on a limb here and say that the number of pipe smoking hobbyists decades back and the number of pipe smoking hobbyists now uh, 
has not changed to any major or significant degree. What has changed and indeed almost entirely vanished are the other pipe smokers. So let me tell you about Jack. In the 1980s, uh, long before I ever dreamt of being a professor, I graduated high school and as was the family tradition, I began working in a steel mill on the south side of Chicago. Uh, Jack, one of my coworkers there, smoked a pipe. Uh, and Jack then was like me now, whereas I've been smoking the pipe for 30 years and he, about the same age as me as I, as I am now, was also smoking a pipe for probably 30 odd years at the time as well. He wasn't responsible for me taking up the hobby, though the presence of his pipe probably had a big influence on when I took it up. But after I began my pipe journey and I learned all I could about it and more on that and later in this very video, I tried on several occasions to engage Jack in pipe talk and I was always disappointed. He didn't know what Latakia was. He complained about the smell of my pipe the first time I smoked Latakia around him. Even words like Virginia and Burley were simply not meaningful to him. And when I asked him uh, what blends he preferred, he replied, whatever's cheapest. And, and to be clear, it's not that he was economically challenged or anything. Uh, it simply reflects his attitude towards the pipe. Which, by the way, I never, I never once saw him clean. I think he just knock out the ashes and refill it. Today, Jack may appear idiosyncratic, if not outright eccentric, but he wasn't. I knew others who were roughly similar to him. Jack smoked a pipe. I was a pipe smoker. And I hope that is interpreted as intended without any allusions to snobbery. I'm not saying I was better than him because I read all I could about my hobby and I bought imported pipes and tobacco tunes. What I am saying is back then you had pipe smokers and you had people who smoked pipes. And there's a difference. Pipe smokers routinely tried out new tobacco blends as we still do. People who smoked pipes uh, usually stuck with one blend that they knew and could trust, or maybe rotated to two or three blends. Uh, pipe smokers could recognize a Dunhill by the dot or a Caminetto by the, the mustache logo. People who smoked pipes could probably tell you where they bought their pipe, but maybe not who made it. And uh, the best analogy I can make is that pipe smoking then is like drinking coffee today. There are people who can tell you the best coffee blends with the best origin of coffee beans. Uh, they may or may not scoff at a, a venti double shot caramel mochaccino. And there are people who just want a damn coffee. And if you can imagine a time when the public turns against coffee and governments levy it silly uh, and, and many coffee farmers go out of business and only the hardcore kind of sewers remain and a few new ones are recruited, then you can begin to appreciate what pipe smoking has become compared to what it was. I mentioned that I had read everything I could about pipe smoking and it would be easy to justify saving this information for another episode, but it does directly tie into the topic of this video, which I've not forgotten is tin descriptions. Uh, in fact, the changes in tin descriptions is really just one possible doorway into this topic. But try, however, to imagine getting information about pipe smoking in a world before the internet was a thing, when most homes didn't even have a, what we used to call a home computer. I mean, really try to envision that because we had very limited resources back then. Uh, one of them was other pipe smokers, and as I've said in my case, that was lacking. One of the other, the biggest uh, resource was your local tobacconist. And again, in my case, uh, I'd smoked a, a few pouches of Captain Black or whatever um, before anyone even mentioned to me that there was this place called Tinderbox in the mall. And I would, you know, later still, I would discover even Reese and an, even an actual Dunhill store. After that, there were books. Now think, if you wanted to buy a book about pipe smoking, where would you go? And don't say Amazon, because we're talking about a time when even if you did have a home computer, you, wouldn't, you might not be able to use it if somebody else was 
using the television because that was your monitor. And you couldn't connect to a bulletin board service uh, if someone on your in your house was using the phone and it was going to be a long distance call anyway, probably. Now, if your local tobacconist didn't carry books, and some did, some didn't, you could try going to a bookstore, but you know there, there was no pipe smoking section of the, of the bookstore. Even today, I wouldn't know what section of a bookstore to, to look under. And it's such a specialty item that it would be foolhardy to expect a bookstore to, to carry such a book. Uh, and that was just as much the case then as it is now. Now, some one good thing is that some pipes uh, did come with little pamphlets that explained a few basics, and I, I may show you one in a later video. I did have a book, though. I, I had The Ultimate Pipe Book by Richard Krautenhacker. Now out of print and going for prices comparable to a, a new mid-grade pipe. But I, I, and I later bought the second edition and I, I had the ultimate pipe video, which was this, this huge VHS tape, uh, which I watched as often as a child watching uh, their favorite animated movie. Uh, and of course, there have been a few pipe magazines over the year. Either your tobacconist carried them or they didn't. A friend of yours had a copy or you just didn't know they existed because how would you? Uh, same with pipe clubs. They they weren't everywhere. They, they still aren't everywhere. Uh, and often there might be one in driving distance from you, but you really had no way to find out if there was or not. Same with pipe shows. I come back to the point that today's pipe smoker is considerably more well-informed today than, than we were back then. We didn't have YouTube or internet forums where we could post questions. You know, we didn't even have search engines then. I don't have an answer to why, you know, people who smoked pipes have largely died out. But the state of things today, which is far, far better than it was when I picked up my first pipe, is not only are we more informed, but we are much more of a community. A community that shares information freely, directly, and correspondence, or, you know, through YouTube to a, a largely faceless audience, whatever. Now, some people were in the industry and, and others were lucky enough to have a, a network of fellow pipe smokers, like those who could attend pipe clubs. But there really was no pipe smoking community in which at least I could participate in, except for talking to my tobacconist, which was always fun. Talking about a pipe smoking community then, at least for people like me, is akin to talking about a cigarette smoking community now. And we can use that phrase. I mean, we, we might we might say the the cigarette smoking community is against such and such proposal, but come on, there is no such group in any meaningful sense of the word community, and that's what pipe smoking was like. Well, I would have loved to have participated in such a group for pipes. Many people, like Jack, would simply have had no interest in it any more than today. We want to meet other people who like coffee. So why are tin descriptions longer and more informative today? Because the average pipe smoker is more informed and will understand it. We are a relatively unified community, unified by, if nothing else, the information at our disposal. If we walk into a pipe shop and peruse tins of tobacco we haven't yet encountered, not only can we read and understand the constituent tobaccos, and indeed we would demand such a list, but we can pull out our phones and quickly Google reviews. And this ignores the fact that most of us probably buy our tobacco online anyway. Between the fading away of the people who smoke pipes and the rise of the information age, a, a coincidence that I think is probably just coincidence, the target audience of pipe tobacco companies has become not only more informed, but more focused. Older companies couldn't just market their products exclusively to the hobbyist, but had to take into consideration the non-specialist. Reading that a blend contains red and lemon, Virginia leaf, Cyprian, Latakia, Oriental Zanprique was probably about as meaningful to people like Jack as you and I reading the ingredients on the back of a bottle of ketchup. So the attrition to people who smoke pipes and the advent of the internet are these the only reasons that tin descriptions have changed? 
I'm not saying they are, and other people, especially those in the industry, might have other explanations that complement or even contradict mine. And I would love to hear from you. Please, comments below. I would love to read those. And to be sure, nothing that I've said so far explains why uh, new blends by long-established blenders have descriptions that are just as short, if not non-existent. But finally, let's just remember that, well, Pipe smoking may not be as common as it once was, a fact that many of us lament. Let's also remember that the attrition to the number of people who smoke pipes has left us with stronger bonds and more information. This has been the first and probably the longest installment of pipe smoking then and now. I sincerely hope you have enjoyed it. In the next episode, I will talk about pipe buying you know, pipe tobacco buying habits how they have changed and it will not just be a matter of well now we go online i will now enjoy my pipe i hope you are enjoying yours please take care hello again as i was editing the video i became aware of a little bit of a overstatement a bit of an oversight that i may have made when I talked about people who smoke pipes as opposed to pipe smokers, uh, there's another group, and I don't want them to be included in, in that category, in either, either of those categories, really. There are many people who have a pipe and smoke it once, twice, three times a year, and often only when they are with us, I think. I think we've all had this experience where someone admires the hobby, they get interested in it, they try it, but they don't really take it up in the sense that we did. Those people are not who I refer to as uh, people who smoke a pipe. When I say people who smoke a pipe, I mean like Jack, who would smoke three, four or five bowls a day. I, you know, and I think like the coffee, people who drink four or five cups of coffee a day, but don't consider it a hobby. To be very clear, when I say people who smoke pipes, I'm referring to people what I think is I think it's a very lost demographic now, but people who would routinely smoke a pipe many times a day, but didn't really consider it a hobby.